who is going to go first um, is a professor of criminology, as I mentioned a moment ago, in the Department of Sociology at Manchester Metropolitan University. Uh, he's been involved in uh, a number of uh, projects there, centred really around uh, well-being and uh, big data and a uh, crime and policing network. He's got extensive expertise in a range of things, criminology, policing, evidence-based policy and various quantitative um, methods. And today, um, John is going to be talking about the way in which the police have responded to crime and inequality. John, floor's all yours. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Steve. Uh, so welcome, everyone, and thank you for taking the time to join us. Uh, today, I'm going to try and speak to three case studies uh, which have been developed by the Understanding Inequalities team and our policing partners. Case studies that seek to shed insight upon the factors shaping policing responses to crime inequality and crucially how these insights might serve to enhance more effective, efficient and legitimate policing with the ambition of ameliorating such inequalities. The first case study is that of domestic abuse. Now, domestic abuse comprises a significant proportion of all calls for service to the police. In our study of uh, Greater Manchester, 8% of all calls to the police were related to domestic abuse. Now, our research spanned multiple dimensions from risk assessment to crime outcomes, but here I just want to focus on the risk classification process. And this is very important because risk classification is associated with the intensity of the resources that are directed to particular incidents. High risk cases capture a significant amount of resource. And if risk classification is not uh, appropriately undertaken and targeted, uh, for example, through the risk aversion of police officers, this may serve to undermine the effectiveness of the intervention. Now, police forces use the domestic abuse, stalking, harassment and honour based, otherwise known as DASH assessment tool to uh, prioritise responses. The tool is comprised of 27 questions. However, there is no guidance as to how to interpret responses to DASH nor evidence of its efficacy or efficiency as a risk assessment tool. Now, our research used multiple approaches, but specifically a machine learning classification model. And we use this to evaluate a data set of 380,000 DASH assessments. Now, the first point is to look at the number of questions respondents answer yes and how that influences their risk classification. You can see from the box plot on the right of this figure that the number of questions answered yes affects the risk classification. Typically standard classifications have two to four uh, responses, answers, question, answers to questions which are yes, medium ones five to 11 and high nine to 16. But if we were to base our prioritization process on this alone, only one third of high risk cases are classified on this basis. In other words, some risk assessments which have, be, which have between nine and 16 yes responses are not classified as high risk, and some that have not answered nine to 16 questions yes are classified as high risk. So the number of questions an individual answers yes is not unimportant, but the classification process we find is shaped by the type of questions an individual answers yes. And here on this slide, I'm contrasting existing research based on the pioneering work of Robinson and her team, in which she interviewed police officers to ask them which questions were associated with high risk, and our own data science approach in which we evaluated 380,000 DASH assessments. Now, if you look at the questions identified under each, you can see that there is some limited overlap between the questions police officers say that they use to identify high risk cases. And in our case, the questions which we find them to use in identifying high risk cases. In short, what we can really say is that the perception of police officers does not necessarily match their actions. 
So responses to Dash are not interpreted in a consistent manner, and this may prove to be problematic. It's clear that not all questions are of equal importance. And certain key questions hold a greater influence on risk categorization, and as our research went on to show, on the crime outcomes that emerge from these cases. We see that reliance upon DASH varies according to the victim characteristics. It varies according to individual and relationship characteristics. The use of DASH is varyingly applied across police divisions. Area deprivation influences reliance upon DASH and the time during the day at which a DASH assessment takes place also influences the outcome. Focusing here on the efficiency of the tool, DASH is a very lengthy questionnaire to complete and there are significant questions which are redundant, in other words, not used in the ultimate risk classification. This is a significant waste, a significant cost to the police. We calculated that on the, on a, in an average year, 190 police officers could be saved, their time could be saved with a more refined DASH tool. Just think of the potential of redeploying 190 officers to address uh, the consequences and resolution of domestic abuse. From this research, we've argued that there's a need to revise a set of DASH questions in a more intelligent way. And what we mean by this is using mobile technologies. For example, enabling parts of the forms to be pre-populated and tailored to the individual's personal and relational characteristics. Such a tool could serve to guide officers experienced or otherwise to make evidence-informed and consistent risk prioritization decisions. And I'm happy to report that our partners here, Greater Manchester Police, are now exploring the development of such an interactive DASH assessment tool. Moving on to our second case study, and this is an examination of violence associated with the nighttime economy. And whilst this is the subject of this particular case, the real issue is about how we assess the scale of a particular problem. Of course, there are crime counts and crime counts are important. They give us an indication of the scale of a problem. But there are also crime rates to consider. Crime rates provide an indication of the character of that problem, whether inequalities in exposure exist across comparable population groups. Crime rates are useful in determining and in evaluating proportionate responses to crime inequalities. They're required to be calculated with reference to specific crime types and with sensitivity to the ebb and flow of the population across the city during an average day. If we fail to meet these requirements, we may inflate or deflate the crime rate and as a consequence impede its effective and proportionate address. So what is the appropriate population to consider? Our research has advanced the notion of an exposed population of risk which we define as a mix of residents and non-residents who may play an active role as an offender, victim or guardian in a specific crime type who are present in a spatial unit at a given time. We're able to do this because we had access to fine-grained mobile phone data and crime data to calculate the exposed population of risk of violent crime in public space. Now, it's worth saying what the exposed population at risk is in relation to violent crime at public space. And here we've argued that it should comprise those entering or leaving a spatial unit uh, during a particular time period. In other words, people moving through an area and also those for whom the spatial unit does not represent an end destination. In other words, they are not at home. Uh, they are participating in public activity in that space. And our measure of violent crime in public space uh, comprises all those incidents that take place within public space in an area and within private spaces to which the public gain access. Now, if you could look at these two maps, these two maps 
provide on the first hand on the left account of violent crime in public space on a Saturday evening. And the uh, red dots on that map present hotspots where there are high counts of violent crime. Those hotspots cluster in and around the major town and city centres of the Greater Manchester region. And right at the centre of the map, you have Manchester city centre, which is the principal location of the night economy. Now, the map on the right hand side, we calculate the, using the exposed population at risk, crime hotspots. Now, if you look at this map, it is slightly different to the map on the left. If you can see right at the center, which is Manchester, there is an absence of hotspots in this area. Now, this implies that, relatively speaking, there's a low count of crime in relation to population size present in this area. In part, of course, this absence of, hot, absence of hotspots is reflective of existing policing practice and should be regarded as a success. That hotspots remain elsewhere. In other words, there are places where violent crime in public space remains high in relation to population size. This must be judged as a sign of failure. But why does this pattern exist? Well, following the research, we undertook interviews with policing staff. And they confirmed that greater police resources being drawn into Manchester city centre on Saturday evenings at the expense of surrounding town and city uh, centres. What I hope you can take from this is that by using such novel data and this approach to calculating a crime specific exposed population at risk, this can be used to guide the deployment and redirection of policing frontline resources. This particular research provokes a wider consideration of the demand for and supply of policing. And this led to this more substantive piece of work which I'm going to move on to now. Now, this particular piece of research looking at the demand for and supply of policing uh, had several motivations. The first to mention is that there's been con some considerable debate over recent years about how the police are funded. And there's been various proposals to revise the police funding formula. And the first question is to assess what police funding formula accounts for the demand for policing. But just to consider the demand for policing is only half the question. It's important to consider whether the resources that the police are granted uh, and how those resources are granted account for the supply of policing. Now, the police funding formula and associated approaches combine a range of neighbourhood, socio-demographic and economic factors and land use based factors. Neighbourhood factors can be understood as measures of neighbourhood vulnerability or population vulnerability and land use based factors can be understood, understood as population generators and as crime attractors. The second question that we're able to move on to in our analysis is to question whether the supply of policing is equitable. Now, this is an important question because if like demands are related too differently, then there is evidence of inequity and such inequity may damage public confidence in policing. Now on this slide, uh, you can see uh, a pie chart to the uh, left of the figure. Now, unfortunately, this, part, this pie chart is meant to be interactive and currently it does not appear to be so. Um, but the pie chart on the left shows crime, antisocial behaviour and public safety and welfare, three of the major demands on police. And if the slide was actually working, which unfortunately it's not, it would show that the scale of these demands vary across the course of the day. The maps on the right hand side uh, of the figure would represent the shifting patterns of these demands of crime, antisocial behaviour and public safety and welfare across Greater Manchester, our case study area, through the course of the day. And if you were to see these, you'd be able to see that the patterns of these three types of demand show a similar consistent spatial patterning 
according to the time of day. Now from this, we ran a number of models. We ran a model ex examining uh, the variables associated with the demand for policing, the variables associated with the supply of policing, the variables associated with the total resource consumed in meeting uh, those demands, and we also looked at the marginal resources associated with calls for service around crime, antisocial behaviour, and public safety and welfare. Now, how to interpret this? We've simplified this. We, we ran multiple models looking at different time periods. But here we have this global model. And the boxes which are shaded in dark red can be understood to be uh, significant, positive, and strong explanatory variables. So, for example, in relation to demand, demand model, a dark red would, uh, box would indicate that that variable explains a significant proportion of demand across space and time. Uh, the dark blue would indicate something which is significant, negative and strong. And the lighter shades exhibit variables which are still significant, uh, but weaker. Now, if you look at the demand model, the most powerful factors shaping both the spatial and temporal patterning uh, of the demand for policing are the percentage of lone parents and bar density. Other social and land use factors are important, but they do not have such a strong influence. When we move to examine supply, we see an evidence seemingly of the weakening influence of social and land use features. These variables, therefore, are seemingly failing to capture the prioritization of responses uh, by the police to demand. And it questions to an extent the appropriateness of funding formulas based purely on demand. However, when we move on to the cumulative model, which is a total resource uh, consumed, frontline resource consumed uh, in meeting incidents, we see a widening and strengthening of both the social features of the urban environment, again to emphasise features which speak to area-based population vulnerability, and also again of our density, something which can be understood as uh, generating population and acting as a crime attractor. In essence, aspects of the police funding formula or variables related to it, therefore, are more effective in explaining the distribution of resource across space and time than of demand itself. And finally, we move to assess the marginal resources uh, committed to incidents. And here we, we mined incident logs, and we've just started this, and we've just picked out alcohol and mental Ill, Ill health as two key variables. And we can see that the presence of alcohol, mental ill health, or both, significantly influence the amount of time an individual incident, whatever its nature, takes to resolve. Now, whilst these models provide uh, an indication of the factors shaping the demand for and supply of policing, we have not yet moved to the assessment of the issue of equity nor how much this might differ across space. And so we move to this slide, which again, unfortunately appears not to be as interactive as I would have liked. In the left hand corner, we have a pie chart. Now this pie chart would grow and shrink according to the time of the day in terms of the incidents that are visited by police officers. Now we're speaking about uh, public safety and welfare, antisocial behaviour and crime again. But also in this pie chart, provide an indication of the resources that are available, uh, but not committed to incidents. On the right hand side, again, we would have maps which, which show the spatial and temporal patterning of supply. And here there is some slight difference in comparison to the patterning of demand, in that the supply of resources seems to vary across 
space between the different types of demand, antisocial behaviour, crime and public safety and welfare. In the bottom left hand corner, there is a bar chart and the bar chart again uh, would be interactive and these different bars would rise and fall according to times of the day. And the bar chart represents the prioritization of incidents by the police. And one being the highest priority, meaning that resources should be dispatched very quickly and resources uh, and the scale of resource might be higher. And as we move down to five, a lower uh, level of prioritization, this does not necessarily result in a deployed resource and there are other forms of resolution. And when we began to examine this, we started to see that the priorities given to crime incidents, pu public safety and welfare incidents and antisocial behavior incidents varied according to the time of day. So there appeared to be some form of inequality in time in terms of how incidents were responded to. We looked at this in a bit more detail. And what we could find was that as deployable resources become constrained, average incident response grades across these different types of incidents fall. For example, if we take the, uh, the issue of crime itself, a 25% fall in deployable resource is likely to result in the average, in, average incident response grade falling by a whole grade. So this shows that there is significant potential inequality in time uh, as to the level of response you receive from the police. We looked at this from in a spatial perspective as well, and we found that across space, there was a mismatch between the demand for policing and the supply of policing to that area. Taking this work as a whole, what we see uh, in blunt terms is that the response to a particular incident varies on the time of day in which the incident is raised and where it is raised from. Uh, bringing this work to a conclusion now, our work found that aspects of the police funding formulas that have been that are in practice and are being proposed are relevant to the consideration of both demand and supply. And yet we think we've been able to show that by making better use of policing data, we can further refine how the relationship between demand and supply is conditioned by complexity uh, of the characteristics of areas, uh, the characteristics of people and of the incidents themselves. Crucially, this is important, not just for addressing the capacity of policing, but also the capabilities that are required of policing. The research found, again, to emphasize that the supply of policing, due to the spatial and temporal mismatch of demand and the availability of resources, can lead to inequitable outcomes. And again, we hope to show that by making, we've shown by making better use of policing data, that it's possible to develop a better demand and supply optimization model, which can be used to inform effective, efficient and equitable policing. And this is where the Understanding Inequalities team are moving to develop research now. Thank you very much for listening to me.